Right. Nollywood, the center of the Nigerian film industry, has in the past 30 years become the third fastest growing film industry in the world, behind India's Bollywood and America's Hollywood. The journey has been challenging, but on the evidence of this progress report, analysts are saying that the uh, striving has been worth every second of it. Generations of players, including actors and behind the scene camera personnel, have also passed through the industry, making the sacrifices along the way. It's indeed a roll call, but for the sake of the next conversation, we shall be focusing on Amoni Oboli, a multilingual, multi award winning Nigerian actress, scriptwriter, director, producer. Amoni was trained at the New York Film Academy, where she studied digital filmmaking. Uh, she began her acting career in 1996 with the movie Beta Encounter and has enjoyed more lead roles in Nollywood, in Nollywood uh, being Mrs. Elliot. Uh, winning many awards along the way, including Best Actress Narrative Feature at the Los Angeles Movie Awards in 2010, the Best Actress at the Harlem International Film Festival and Big Screen Actress of the Year Award at the 2014 Eloy Awards for her movie, Being Mrs. Elliot. Omoni, who presently resides in Canada, now joins us to discuss her filmmaking experience, especially as it concern, concerns evolving from an actress to a producer and a director. Welcome to the program. Uh, it's a pleasure talking to you, Amoni. Ah, <laughs> you're now in Canada. Oh, great. Been a while. And great to see you again. Uh, I just want to talk to you about your evolution, Amoni. Uh, pretty much know how you started. I mean, this story is quite very dear to me. From the days of DSE, if you remember, Amoni. So you know yes. who's talking to you, who's <laughs> talking to you now. Uh, to being an actress, to evolving, to going back to school, to finishing school, and, you know, to being a director. How's the journey been? Whew. First of all, good morning, everybody. <laughs> it's uh, an honor and a privilege to be how here. Are you, Amoni? All good of morning. you. Hi, Ruben. Hi. Hi, Tinder. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi. It's great to be here, like I said. Um, it's still very early here, so my face is not very together, but you will have to manage me like that. <laughs> so, anyways, yeah. Um, it's, been a, it's been an amazing ride, you know. Um, transiting from an actress to a producer director is never easy everywhere in the world, you know, especially when everyone knows you as... Um, one role in the industry, especially for actors. Once you're trying to transit into producer, director, people are always a bit skeptical. Okay, what's going on here? Why do you have to do this? Why can't you just stay on your lane, so to speak, you know? Um, and especially when you're a woman, then it's even doubly difficult because when you say director, automatically everyone thinks it's a man, you know? And then when I was tr um, trying to transit a few years ago, we didn't have that many female directors in Nigeria, you know? Pretty much just had a Makaigo of blessed memory and one or two other women, you know. So it was it was quite difficult. I had tried my best, you know, to learn on the job. You know, every job that I was part of, I would constantly be beside the director, trying to learn something or the other. And then when I decided I was really going to do this, it was a scary thought. And then I said to myself, it would be better if I get some sort of formal education on it. I mean, it was it was okay to just Transit and just learn on the job and become a director. But I just wanted to get some formal education, which is why I went to New York Film Academy. I took a short course in digital filmmaking, you know. And it took me four years after that course to actually make my first film, because then you now have to talk about finances to make a film, because nobody is going to give a rookie director their their money to direct a film. So, be Mrs. Elliot, my my baby, my first film. It took me four years after um, film school to actually make that film because I had to knock on so many doors. I had to, at the point I just said, you know what, I'm going to do this film any which way. So I gathered all my family funds together and I started to make the film without enough money to finish it. But, you know, it, it's, it's funny when they say, just start something, somehow the universe would align. That's what happened with being Mrs. Elliot. Some of the doors I had knocked on before, like some even three years before, some companies had gone to for product placement and stuff like that. The minute I decided I was going to start it, by hook or crew, and I started it. They started to align, and by the time I was finishing this film, I pretty much had enough money for post production and marketing. So that was that's how I started with Mrs. Elliot, and the rest, as they say, is history. So I just started to make movie after movie, you know, get the funds from each movie, make another one, you know, and, and that's how we're here today. Well, Amoni, good to see you again after such a long time. Thank you, Ruben. Yeah, it's so, uh, <laughs> But let me ask you about, you know, this uh, COVID-19 uh, challenge that the whole world is facing. 
and the creative industry has also been uh, adversely affected. So yeah. I would like to ask you, how market, have you been able to work around <laughs> COVID-19 to remain active? And then what do you think of the steps that have been taken by the Nigerian government uh, to address the concerns of the uh, creative industry? You recall that a committee was set up uh, led by uh, Atuyota Akwabeme, that's uh, Alibaba, as is popularly known. Uh, do you think that the Nigerian government is helping enough uh, in terms of the concerns of the creative industry? Okay, so I'm going to start your question from the beginning. So, of course, we've been greatly affected. Um, when this happened, so, I, I mean, I live in both countries. I live in both Nigeria and Canada, uh, and I mostly work in Nigeria anyway. So, when this um, COVID-19 started and it looked like there was going to be a lockdown, I was right in the middle of production in Nigeria. I had to quickly just pack it up and leave. So we didn't completely finish. We're almost done, but we just have, we still have a few things to pick up after this whole thing is over. Now, um, as you know, most um, filmmakers, you know, people who work in um, crew members, actors, most of them live from paycheck to pay paycheck. So. We're talking about from job to job, you know. So for the past, for almost four months now, pretty much everyone's been home, not really doing anything. Um, the only saving grace for people like me is because I have a slate of movies, I can still um, sell the rights to my movies to different platforms and all of that. So I, I still have some sort of residual income coming in. But if you're not a producer who has a slate of movies, then, I, then I'm worried because I don't know how you've been able to make an income, which means you're probably just living on your savings, uh, if you even have savings, you know. So it's it's really been a tough one. Um, all over the world, many um, governments and you know are trying to help their people with some sort of palliative or the other. Nigeria didn't really do much of that. Uh, the creative industry has really suffered. Not much has been done to help in any way, shape or form. Um, I don't think any funds were given, not even, even if there were loans, you know, um, nothing has really been done to help the creative industry. People are just trying to get their act back together now to find a way to start working. And even like that, as a producer, it, it's more expensive for you now to shoot because now you have to do tests for everyone on set. Imagine doing a movie like Love is War, a movie that just got released on Netflix. So Love is War is a political drama, which means we had a large cast and so many extras. We had hundreds of extras, you know. Imagine doing a movie like that now. So I have to test every single one of those extras and house everybody, cast, crew, you know. It, it would be impossible to shoot. It would take the budget twice. It would, the budget already a high budget movie would be twice the cost, you know. So um, I feel like the government needs to do a lot more. This is a sector that is bringing a lot of income into the, into the um, society. So employing so many people on every one movie shoot that I that I do, hundreds of people get paid, you know. So I, I feel like the government needs to do a lot more to help us. They haven't really done anything. Thank you for that. And you raised the point I was going to ask you because you're the perfect person to ask, seeing as you wear so many hats in your industry. I try to figure out how you could shoot a movie in this era of COVID-19. Pre-production, post-production is possible, but the actual filming, as you said, mm -hmm. when you're filming like a love is war with all those scenes, you cannot have social distancing. You can't wear a mask. So, but does no. this create an opportunity to look into another sort of movie and develop the arts in a different direction? Are you challenged in any way by this? Whew. So, I, I mean, I. It's tough. It's a tough question to answer because at the end of the day, it's almost like you're going to stifle creativity. So now you're thinking, I have to do a different type of film. I have to make sure my, my crew is, I have, a small, I have a small cast. Crew, you can pretty much manage, to be honest. Um, you can make sure all your crew members are tested. We always house our crew members anyway. I have crew accommodation where I house my crew members. So all my crew members stay in one place for every shoot. So that's fine. You can make sure they are all tested and they all stay in one place. But then the kind of story you're now going to tell would have to have a limited cast because now you have to how, test your cast and house them, right? And, and, and give them accommodation and make sure they're all in one place and nobody goes anywhere. 
and every um, every place you're going into shoot, every location, you have to send an advance party to um, do the. I don't know. I, I don't. I don't think it's fumigation, but whatever. Like spray the place and make sure it's it's sanitized and all that. You know. So, so I feel like it's going to stifle creativity quite a bit because now you have to start thinking of smaller stories to tell. Not that there's anything wrong with smaller stories, but what if you don't want to tell that kind of story? You know, so it's 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 a dilemma. It's like you're torn between the devil and the devil because now you don't know what to do. Which which way do you go? Do you do you just make sure your 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 stories are smaller, or do you now spend the money to make a big story and make sure that everyone is tested and everyone is staying in the same place and no one is leaving? And it's whew, it's a tough call for the industry right now. It is a tough call. All right, uh, Amoni, let, let's talk about Netflix. What is Netflix doing to the industry? Is it making all your work, you know, uh, show now, as it were, in local parlance? You know, uh, is the money worth it? Uh, is it giving you that traction you deserve? Uh, is it giving you that worldwide exposure? Uh, is, it, is, it, is it making uh, filmmakers handsomely rewarded? Because that has always been the challenge in this country. They churn out very good movies. Uh, pirates take their cuts. All sorts of people take their cuts. They're not handsomely rewarded. You have billionaires as film stars abroad, but in Nigeria, I can hardly find somebody in Nollywood, correct me if I'm wrong, that is a billionaire. My brother, myself, I'm looking for the person. <laughs> which so, is which uh, is sad for the which is sad for the fourth sad. largest movie industry in the world. Yeah, it's sad. So um, I was having a conversation with one of my movie friends um, last night. Well, last actually last night into this morning, you know. And one of the conversations that we're having was about our counterparts outside Nigeria and how much money these people are making and how hard we work and we're not even seeing. 2% of the money that they, they're making. I mean, a lot, a lot has to do with the way our government is set up. That's the truth, you know. But let's talk about Netflix. Um, as it is right now, Netflix is paying the most, you know. Um, can it be better? Of course. It can always be better. So, so sorry, sorry, paying... sorry to cut you in, because we'll go for a break soon. But just ruminate on this question. So Netflix is paying you more than what you'll even get from the cinemas, right? Oh, okay. So that's a different ball game altogether, right? So the truth is, you can't really compare um, the cinemas and a platform that's showing your film, because really, it's they're two different things. You're supposed to first show the film in the cinema, and then have other platforms show the films, like online platforms and all of that. So it's it's kind of hard to compare, especially because um, the film is supposed to have shown for a long period of time or however long it showed in the cinema um, before it goes on Netflix. And the truth is, it, if the movie does, does very well in the cinema, it actually increases your chances of getting bigger money with Netflix. Because okay. then the movie is very popular, they really want okay. it. So just, just so hold on on that thought. Uh, my, my dear, please just hold on on that thought. We'll go for a quick break, we'll come back, and I want you to tell us about those technicalities. We'll be right back. Right, uh, we're still talking to it's their rise news channel. We're talking to Amani Oboli, uh, multi multilingual, uh, multi award winning Nigerian actress. Yeah, Amani, you studied French, right? Or linguistics? Yes, I did. Okay, studied French. Well, Good. For, foreign languages. Foreign languages. Okay, you majored in French, yeah. So, as I was saying, you were, you were trying to let me understand how, if you do well in the cinemas, then you will, it'll, it'll give you a better bargaining power on Netflix. Mm -hmm. But there are some yes. deals that were just truly exclusive, like the Genevieve's deal with Lion Hart, for instance. Mm -hmm. It was just a truly exclusive deal. It didn't really come to the cinema. I think they took it off the cinemas after the first day. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure um, how that panned out. But if, even when Netflix does originals, which are movies that are exclusive or series are exclusive to Netflix, um, most times there's actually a window where you can show the movie in the cinema. 
Okay. Maybe they'll give you like um, a few weeks or three months or whatever, so you can show the movies at the cinema only. And after that, it's completely on their platform. So yeah, so I'm not sure how that pan, panned out, but that's how it works normally. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> let me ask you, what motivates you? I know I read uh, something maybe on your on your uh, Twitter uh, account about you saying, look, you are not just in the arts uh, for the sake of it. Uh, you are there to make, to effect change in society. Do you think that Nigeria is a country that can be changed? And if you are an agent for change, what are your priorities? Gender politics or what? Um, so I'm all about female empowerment. So um, we, we live in a very patriarchal society, as we all know. So for me, one of the things that, one of my main goals is to make sure that I effect change in the lives of women. You know, um, make sure that economically women have uh, more power. Politically, women have more power. Women just have a seat at the table and they have a say, especially when it comes to what happens to them and their kids, you know, because I always feel like once a woman is empowered, then the family is empowered, you know, um, because a woman would make sure all the time that her kids are well taken care of, her family is well taken care of, everything is okay on the home front. So if she's empowered politically, economically, you know, she, she things will work better, you know, and it doesn't mean that um, we want to disenfranchise the men or we want to push men to the background. No, I'm not even one of those kind of women. I'm a woman who believes that, yes, a man is the head of the home, but that doesn't mean that I cannot be empowered as well. You know, so I'm really, if, if you notice, unwittingly, most of my films have female empowerment at its core, you know. So it, it's either we're talking about wives on strike, women fighting for change in one way or the other, or we're talking about love is war, where a woman is running against her husband <laughs> for a political position or, you know, so or we're talking about a movie like um, Wings of a Dove, which is not released yet, which is what they are showing right now, um, about um, child rights, you know. So somehow or the other, I've, I've always talked about women empowerment. I've always tried to make movies to showcase how women can be better in society. Thanks. You've used a lot of comedy and the rom-com sort of genre to put this point across. But tell us about this new movie about child brides. That is certainly not comedic. That's dramatic. No. What, what has made you, you know, switch genres? So what happened was I made a film called Wives on Strike. So I have two Wives on Strike movies. The first one was a huge success. So we decided to do a sequel. So the first Wives on Strike was about a group of local market women who um, fought the marrying of an underage girl. They led the whole nation on a nationwide um, sex strike to fight the marrying off of an underage girl. We used humor as a vehicle to, to pass on this message. And it was hugely successful. But I, I just couldn't go to sleep afterwards. Like, I just, I was so bothered about the issue of child rights. And I felt like I hadn't done enough. I felt like, yes, we've talked about this. We've tried to push the hand of the government. You know, the child act laws, we talked about all those things, but we didn't get to meet the child bride. We don't know who she is. People talk about her, but they don't know her. Who is she? What are her dreams? What are her aspirations? What does she feel? What does she think? You know, so I wanted people to meet the child bride. And her story is not pleasant at all. So you can't even use humor as a vehicle to tell that story. So I, I actually first went to Kano. I did a research on, you know, child brides. I, I spoke to a number of child brides. I spoke to um, former child brides, women who were now in their 60s and 70s. I spoke to girls in the VVF clinics. You know, so I did, I did my research first, and I, I put together a mini documentary before actually making the film. And the, sto the stories were not pleasant, but the one thing, the underlying factor for all of them, all the little girls that I spoke to, without exception, all wanted to go to school all wanted to get an education, you know? So I felt like their story needed to be told and humor was not in their story at all. All right, as we wrap up, uh, all of these great things you're doing, but as a man, you know, that has been in support of all of this and that has constantly pushed you, Namdi, can you talk a little bit about 
<laughs> Everyone knows Namdi is, Namdi is um is I say Namdi is the wind beneath my wings. Wow. Because if he didn't give me the the opportunity that he's given me, if he didn't if he didn't let me be or just let me soar, I wouldn't be able to. Right. So I feel like the society. Too, I'm not just trying to blow my husband's trumpet, but I feel like the society needs more Namdis. Women need need more Namdis that would allow their wives or allow their their women to 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 thrive, to soar. Okay, babe, this is what you want to do. That's fine. I'm behind you. Just know that the family will be fine. You go and do your thing. You know. So um, Namdis Nam, Namdi is an amazing person. I, I don't know what else to say. Well, Amani, before we go, do you want to talk very briefly about the Amani Obuli Foundation? So um, I set up that foundation to, again, for the betterment of women and um, children, because that's, I'm very passionate about stuff like that. So um, a few years ago, I started something called Sister Lizzie's Kitchen. It's a memory of my mom, because my mom, everyone called her Sister Lizzie. I mean, even my sister and I called my mom Sister Lizzie. Crazy, don't ask me. So everyone called her that, you know. And my mom was very giving. Very, my mom would um, give everything to 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 the last, to the last. Like would literally have very little to eat because my mom has given everything else. I was raised by a single mom, you know. So I set up that to um, it's, it's like a feeding outreach, but it's also an educational outreach program because when we go to do the feeding drives, we actually before giving the kids any food or giving the women any food or anything, we make sure we talk to them first. We talk to them about um, prostitution. We talk to them about drug abuse. We talk to them about the need to get an education, stay in school. You know, so for me, the education part of it is more important. But, you know, you don't go to someone who's starving and just talk to them about, about things. You give them food first. So that's why we, we always use food as um, the driving force for, for those drives that we do. Well, thank you very much, Omoni Ubele. I think uh, yeah. Tundun Rufa, we should let her go. Thank you. Thank you it's so much. It's good to see you again. And that's all. Good to see you. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you.